Mark's Gospel, chapter number 8. Will you join me in your Bibles? And Once we have read, then we will sit together and we'll consider the text of Scripture. Mark, chapter 8. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 22, though the running start to the text begins in verse number 1. I want to, I want to uh, move quickly in the text and don't want to try your patience. I know there are other things besides me on the agenda for this morning. Here begins a reading of God's word from Mark chapter 8, verse number 22. I'll read down through verse number 26. I'll read it aloud from the King James Version, if you'll read silently in whatever version that you have. Mark 8, 22 reads, And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. Do you see anything? And he looked up the blind man and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, Jesus put his hands upon his eyes. And made him look up. And he was restored. And saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying. Neither go into the town. Nor tell it to any in the town. This is the word of the Lord. Y'all say thanks be to God. I'm going to give it again. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. I want to talk to you for the next few moments that have been allotted unto me on the power of another touch. The power of another touch. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Um, There are a lot of angles and a lot of, of avenues that I would like to explore, but time will not permit me, but allow me to say by, by way of introductory comments that touch is important. Now, for those of you all that have not ever sat under my ministry or my preachment at least, um, uh, you will come to discover today that I am a touch your neighbor kind of preacher. Um, I believe that you ought to bother people around you. I believe you ought to kick them or punch them or poke them or do something to bother them and to, to disquiet them uh, because the reality of the matter is is that human touch is necessary for human existence. The, the, uh, the, uh, the pediatric study was done in the uh, uh, 1980s that uh, rendered the information unto us that there were 12 children born around the same time and they were submitted for an experiment, I believe it was at Johns Hopkins University Hospital, and the experiment went thusly. The children were born, and six of the children were immediately whisked off into the nursery, where they were given the basics of, of uh, necessities for life. They were fed, they were changed, and, uh, and they were kept warm, and they were kept in all the basic necessities where that's concerned, yet they were left alone. Uh, the other six children were given all the basic necessities, put in a, a separate ward, an incubating ward, and, and they were fed and they were nurtured, they were changed, they were cared for in that way. But for several hours of the day, like any new mother, they were held, they were touched, they were caressed. And what they discovered was after six weeks in this particular experiment, the children that had been held and touched with human hands uh, in addition to being changed and being fed, were developmentally 40% ahead of the children who had not been touched. And from that, the study concluded that human touch is necessary for development. While I recognize I'm in trouble already, that we live in an internet age and an age of virtual reality, 
in an era where there are some alleged and so-called experts that will tell you that anything that can be accomplished in, in, in real community can be accomplished in virtual community. I stand today to tell you that's a lie. While I recognize that we have a vir virtual campuses all over the place, that I recognize that there are people watching my live stream, and I do not want you to turn me off by being offended by that last statement. I want you to understand that any type of electronic community needs to be supplemental to the real community of those of us coming together. What do you mean, Bishop? Don't stay home and watch the computer if you can make it to the house of God. Why? If for no other reason, you need somebody to touch you. <laughs> Encourage your neighbor and tell them there's power in another touch. Yeah. I think it's extremely important that we understand that particularly on anniversary days because anniversaries give us an opportunity to touch again. Yeah. To get in touch with history to be uh, touched by and impacted by the sacrifices that have gone before us. The people, some of whom, who are no longer with us, touched by memory, touched by sentiment, touched by devotion to principles, things that we started doing 23 years ago that were bedrock principles for Rhema Word Church are still being carried on today. And dear friends, every now and then, we need to be touched by that to remember why we're doing this anyway. And so the text reveals to us some curious things about the power of another touch. Chapter in a nutshell, beginning in verse number one, reveals that Jesus fed 4,000 earlier in the text. Uh, some of the numbers are different from numbers in, in, the, uh, in other accounts of Jesus feeding multitudes, and you have to decide whether or not it's the same account being told in a different way, in a different gospel, or you have to decide whether or not Jesus fed more than one multitude. Really doesn't matter to me either one. My, my hermeneutics allows for both. They're not mutually exclusive because the reality of the matter is wasn't nobody sitting there scribing things and writing down and counting the people and all that. No, they were telling the story. Can I say, that, are y'all mature enough for me to say the details aren't as important as the, as the ethos of the story? The story is that the bottom line is Jesus can work miracles. If you're hungry, he can feed you. The text opens up with Jesus feeding 4,000. And then, and then, then he, he, he and his disciples take a boat and cross over. And, then, and when they get to the other side, they, they get to the house of fishing, the city of Bethsaida. And when they get there, Jesus is teaching using bread as a spiritual metaphor. And while on the boat, the disciples think he's throwing off on them because they only brought one loaf. Now, it is kind of ridiculous that he performed a miracle. You ought to keep some miracle bread just because Jesus did something. And they get on the boat and act like, you know, that wasn't nothing. They only have one loaf with them and then they're hungry. And so Jesus uses his bread as a metaphor. And finally, he critiques the Pharisees' need for a sign when they get to the other side in Bethsaida and the disciples' lack of understanding about bread and what he just performed by way of a miracle. This miracle that he performed that we read about where the blind man is concerned was birthed out of Jesus' frustration. Now, I know that some of your theology doesn't allow you to let Jesus get frustrated. I know some of y'all only want to see him as sweet and nice and docile and always with a smile on his face and kind of frail and maybe even a little effeminate and all kind of, you know, get sissified with flowing locks of hair. But, but that's, that's not the Jesus that I've come to know. See, the cat that carried uh, that cross up the Via Dolorosa all the way up to Calvary, you realize that cross weighed about 220 pounds. Could Jesus had to be kind of a man's man to be, take a beating and then carry that cross up to here. He was a carpenter, y'all. He wasn't a seamstress. Jesus was kind of a man's man in my estimation. Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole, in his, in his seminal work, The Maximized Manhood, said that Christ-likeness and manhood are synonymous. To be a real man is to be Christ-like. I mean, Jesus had to have some intimidation about him in, in, in that he went into the temple where folk were making money and start flipping over tables and chairs and driving people out with a whip, and nobody stood against him. 
kind of suggests to me that Jesus would put something on you if you come up on it. I mean, my vision of Jesus doesn't look like Michelangelo's Jesus. We just, no, my vision of Jesus is kind of hood Jesus. I'm joking, that would knock you out if you try him. Anyway, I'm just saying, uh, you know, the, the, the text, the, Jesus got frustrated. It seems to me that Jesus is frustrated when I read verses 10 through 12. He's frustrated with the Pharisees for their need for a sign. They're always making him have to prove himself. And I don't know if that resonates with anybody in the room, but I've learned in my 52 years of life, I am, I am no longer hanging out with people that keep on making me prove that I am who I say that I am and trying to make me try, always putting me to the test. And all that. that devil is a lie. I am 52. Think of me the way you want to think of me. I have crossed that line. I am what I am. I am who I am. And I am who I am by God's grace. And so you can't take nothing from me not recognizing who I am. And you can't add nothing to me by recognizing who I am. Because all that I am and ever will be is by the grace of God. Now it's time to touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't judge me. I am who I am. Jesus got frustrated with the disciples, with the Pharisees, because they kept on trying to put him to the test. And the tests always involved human misery. They would say, okay, if you're God, do something about this. So they would toy with and play with marginalized, oppressed, messed up people to try to get Jesus to prove that he was who he says he was so that way uh, if he didn't do it then they, those people would turn against him. Sort of like what Trump, I mean what, sort of like what they, Jesus was frustrated. He was also frustrated with his disciples if you read verses 20, 14 through 21. That whole conversation about bread that he uses as a metaphor comes up in verses 14 through 21. It's before our text. I just want to kind of bring you up to speed so that when we dive into our text, we can understand what's going on. Jesus is frustrated with the disciples. Like, I just broke all the, y'all only brought me a few loaves and, and a few fish. That's what the text says. It doesn't say, you know, two and five like it does in the other text. But, but the marking uh, rendering of it says they brought him a few loaves. And then, and then later on it says, he began to break the loaves. And later on it says, and some had a few fish and afterward there were seven baskets left over that's what the text says seven baskets left over you get on the boat and all you got is one I'm, I'm, I'm always frustrated by people who have experienced miracles but don't walk in the miraculous okay let me see if I can say that differently some of y'all have seen too much to still be broke some of y'all have experienced too much to not walk in the favor of God some of y'all have sat in atmospheres where God has been moving so mightily and you have never ever experienced it and then you get on the boat of life on the sea of your journey and you only have one loaf with you? What I put it up seven loaves, seven baskets you were just dealing with. Can I suggest to you, you ought to take something out of every experience. That's why when other people shout, you ought to shout. Y'all missed it. I saw it when it went past your head. Because just because God's blessing them doesn't mean that there's not something in it for you. Now it's time to touch your neighbor on the other side. Shake the hand and say, neighbor, you better get in with me today. Because I believe God's got a blessing for me. But that blessing's going to spill over into your life just because you're sitting next to me. You've got to learn how to eat from somebody else's basket. This is why when people prophesy, there's always not just one person. Somebody's getting a prophetic word in the room. There's always four or five other people to whom that word is applicable. Every now and then when God is speaking to somebody else directly, you might be sitting up in the back of the room. Y'all don't like this kind of talk. I was in Birmingham on Thursday and Bishop Neil Ellis was prophesying to the man of God who we were consecrating the bishop. And, uh, and uh, he was speaking the good word of the Lord over him. And I was standing over there in my seat and I was saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I receive it in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. I threw my hand up in the air and said, yes, Lord. I got it. I got it. I got it. And the man standing next to me was looking over me like, he was like I was crazy. And he was like, you know he's prophesying to him. I said, yes, he is. Is, but everything he's saying to him is too much for one life so it's got to flow into another life and I'll just be the one that stand even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table shake your neighbor's hand and say neighbor it's for you whether you realize it or not
Jesus is frustrated with the disciples. He said, what's wrong with y'all? I'm always amazed by Jesus because he would say stuff like, he would say stuff to him, you faithless generation. How long will I abide with you? And then he turned around and said, now go preach my gospel. I'm like, those two things don't go together. It was almost as if Jesus was saying, y'all are so faithless. Y'all are so silly. Y'all are so lack of understanding. But you're all I got. Now go preach. As a pastor, I sometimes resonate with those sentiments. Y'all are all I got to work with. Go do it. Jesus was frustrated. It seems to me from the text that the only group that Jesus was not frustrated with was the masses of people. In the beginning of the text, the 4,000 were hungry. He never breathed the word of frustration about feeding them. In the 22nd verse where our text, it picks up, there was a blind man. He never was frustrated by being interrupted by a man who had a need. I think that we've twisted ministry around today. And maybe we need to recalibrate ministry. Because too often, we are tolerant of the Pharisees, but intolerant of the people. We make room for people who should frustrate us. And we're frustrated by people who we should make room for. So the text gives us an indication that Jesus was frustrated by Pharisees and undiscerning disciples. But he had infinite amounts of patience and understanding for hungry masses and blind individuals. So he comes to the house of fishing, the city of Bethsaida, and they bring to him a man who was blind. And they asked him to do something about this man's blindness. <laughs> it's curious to me because when I've previously, I, when I was a child and I would hear people preach this text, it was curious to me they always talked about a second touch and I was tempted to entitle this sermon The Power of a Second Touch until I realized something. That before he touched his eyes, he touched his hand. The Bible says, did y'all read it in your text? Let me see. I'm going to get back to my Bible. I'm, I'm operating with just my iPad today, so praise the battery doesn't go out. Um, uh, the, the Bible says, he comes to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand. Everybody say, that's the first touch. <laughs> what a curious thing. He, he takes him by the hand. You see, in our era of laying on hands, we lay hands on people where the infirmity is. And the, but the Bible says he took him by the hand, and not only did he take him by the hand, what else did it say he did to him? Y'all still reading? Took him by the hand and did what? Yeah. Led him out of town. It's a curious phenomenon because Jesus' first touch was not a healing touch. Jesus' first touch with the blind man was, seems to imply that if you have my guidance, you don't need sight. Could it be that we are asking him to give us sight when we really need guidance? Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. The truth of the matter is some of us have confused sight with guidance. Here, let me see if I can say that differently. If you can't trust him when you're blind, you won't serve him when you can see. The problem is, some of us want him to heal us of our malady in our current condition, and then, and then we promise in the future we're going to do for him. But the truth is, can you serve him while you're still blind? Can you follow him even though you're blind? Can you stick out your hand and trust that he's not going to lead you the wrong way while you're still blind? Or do you need a healing in order to serve him? And my thesis is, if you don't trust him while you're blind, you won't serve him when you get sight my concern for the church is is that some of us though we celebrate 23 years of God's grace in the midst of us some of us have been walking around blind for 23 years we've trusted God with a guiding touch 
Hear me on this, precious dears, because the truth of the matter is, is that sometimes he will leave you blind so that way you learn how to depend on him. The text, is, the text is clear. I didn't make it up. It's in your Bibles. It's in the Bibles in Chicago, just like the Bibles in Atlanta. It's, it's in your Bible. The Bible says he took him by the hand and led him out of the city. Now, they came up into the city. They brought the blind man to him. And the first thing Jesus does, take him by the hand and take him out of the city. In other words, you got to learn how to follow me when you don't know which way you're going. You got to learn how to follow me even though your situation hasn't changed. You got to learn how to stick with me even though things haven't gone your way. You got to learn how to tr trust in me even though the people brought me to you telling you that I was going to heal you. I am going to heal you, but you got to learn how to wait on my healing. The Bible says that the, they brought him to Jesus and Jesus took him by the hand. First thing that Jesus did in taking him by the hand was he changed the man's location. He took him out of the city. See, see some, uh, uh, can I suggest to you, some of your blindness has nothing to do with something going on inside. Some of y'all are blinded by where you are. Every now and then he has to grab you by the hand and move you out of your current location. I'm, help, I'm trying to help somebody and I'll help you if you let me. Some of y'all have been blaming the devil and been frustrated with the Lord because things have changed in your life and the people that used to hang with you don't hang with you no more or the job you had you lost or the situation you were in you had to move out of. But can I suggest to you today sometimes Jesus has to move you to heal you. He's got to change your location in order to give you your sight. It's your location that is keeping you blind. He takes him out of his familiar crowd. Every now and then, Jesus, Jesus comes to the city. He's, he's, heal this blind man. Takes him by the hand. Says, all right, come on. Let's get away from some of these people. Let, let's get out of this place. Let, let's get out of this circumstance. Let's get out of this situation. Oh, y'all don't like this kind of talk right here. Because in your 23rd year, some of y'all going to have to leave some people. Some of y'all going to have to leave some places. Some of you are going to have to relocate in order to see. Because your circumstance is keeping you. Y'all don't like this, this kind of talk right here. Because see, you don't want to admit that it is the small mindedness of the people around you that keep you blind to the fact that you could be the CEO of the company. But the reason that you stay small is because you're trying to impress people that only like you when you're blind. But I came to let somebody know today that you're going to have to learn how to let some people and some places go because God's about to give you your sight back. And if you got people in your life that only like you when you are broken and small and emaciated and never grow, then you're going to have to learn how to let those people go. I have made an inner vow. I am not going to shrink back just to make other people comfortable. I'm not going to reduce myself just so somebody else can feel good about themselves. As a matter of fact, as I'm liberated, it liberates everybody. I dare you to touch four people and tell them I'm a good person to be around today because I'm getting my sight back. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm concerned about some of y'all's friends. I'm concerned about some of y'all hanging out with people that only like you when you're broke. Only like you when you're small. I know I got that right because the minute you start ascending, the minute you start moving towards sight, they start saying stuff like, I don't know what's wrong. You change and things are different. You don't call me anymore. No, I don't call you no more. Let me tell you why I don't call you. Every time I call you, you make me blind. Every time I call you, you keep me broke. Every time I call you, you make me feel worse about myself. The devil is a liar. I got to get around people that recognize that if God be for me. Jesus took him by the hand, changed his location, changed his crowd, got him away from the stuff that was perpetuating his blindness. Well, he needed to be away from people who could not conceive him healed. There are some people who can't even see you any better than what you are right now. 
I just come to discover I don't hang out with nobody that can't see further into my life. I'm only hanging out with prophetic people nowadays because prophetic people have a way of prophesying into your life and say, I, I see where you are right now, but I'm seeing something bigger than where you are right now. I need about 27 people to just prophesy to four people around you and tell them, I see you bigger than what you are right now. I see your life better than what it is right now. I see your children doing more than what they're doing right now. I see your life higher than what it is right now. I see you making more money. That some of y'all ain't prophesied to nobody. Every now and then you have the terrible misfortune of sitting next to the wrong person. But I need everybody to prophesy to somebody and tell them, I see you in the future and things look a whole lot better than they look right now. I don't too much hang out no more with people who can, are only comfortable with me if I'm beneath them. I'm just, so much has happened around your 23rd anniversary, and, and, and you know, haters gonna hate, hey, 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 hey. Shake it off, shake it off. I'm just saying. A lot has happened in your life over these last several months, and, and anytime elevation happens in a man's life, it reveals the people around you. And I, I have stopped feeling guilty about trying to take people places that they're not constitutionally ready to go. Let me let y'all in on a secret. Everybody in your life is not healthy enough to go where God's trying to take you. I'm not disparaging people, but all I'm saying to you is sometimes you and I relegate our own lives to a particular station so that way other people will be comfortable with us. And Jesus is guiding us, trying to bring us to healing, and we are pulling back saying, no, I want to stay here with these people because they like me blind. They get on me because my, my vocabulary is extensive. <laughs> they do. They do. I have well many people in my life that you have to, you have to bring that from the top shelf and put it down on the lower shelf. You, know, you cook a good meal, but you put it too high for the people to get there. The devil is a lie. When you get hungry enough, You'll learn how to climb. You'll get a chair, a step stool, a ladder. You'll get somebody to give you a leg up. There's some biscuits up there, and if I get them, I'll share them with you. I mean, come on. I paid too much money going to all them colleges and universities and schools for me to come out and split verbs and can't conjugate tonight. Y'all not saying nothing to me. Now. Come out here, my subject verb don't agree just to make you comfortable with me. That devil is a lie. I think it's important, y'all, because everybody is not happy. Now, I got two or three more points on this, but I feel really drawn to help Raymond Word Church understand that where God is taking you is not a popularity contest. Yeah. Everything popular ain't godly. As a matter of fact, I'm typically suspect of the stuff that the crowds run to. Now, I believe everything that God's in is ought to grow. I've, I've experienced it, I've been there, done that, spent the night and got the t-shirt. And it ain't all that it's cracked up to be. Because what I've come to find out is that when things continue to get, uh, let me see if I can say this the right way. People typically do not invest the kind of spiritual or emotional equity into something as long as it is serving them. But the minute that it, t it takes a turn for something outside of their interests and needs, they divest their spiritual and emotional energy. Does that make sense to you? 
it's like the, my children. When my children were small, we used to take them to, to Six Flags or take them to Disney World. Take, take, we take them all some, some everywhere. And when we'd be driving back, we'd be coming back from Orlando or something. We'd have spent at Universal Studios. I'd spent thousands of dollars entertaining them. We'd come back and they'd stop at McDonald's to eat. And they go in there and get a meal and all of that stuff. And we try to make back that land a certain amount of time and everything. And then there's, you know, some of the McDonald's on the road, they have a playland out there. And then my three kids come, Daddy, Daddy, can we go out and play in the playland? No, baby, we got to hurry up and get back on the road and get going. And then they have the gall to look me in the face and say, we never get to do it. Just make you want to choke them out. Just. But such is our spiritual lives with people who have no interest in our growth and our success. They will divest and drain you of life and vitality after you have taken them to Disney World. The first time you say no, they devote, they divest every iota of, of equity that they had, relational equity in your life, and act like you ain't never done nothing for me. And I've just come to my a, a spiritual epiphany that those people are not a part of the one, they're part of the crowd that'll keep me blind. They're not Jesus who is trying to liberate me and give me sight. And in your 23rd year, I just want you to have the courage to be able to divest from people who want to keep you blind. Can I keep on moving now? That was the first touch. Everybody say the first touch. Now, the, the first touch was a converting touch. The first touch was a guiding touch. The first touch was Jesus taking the man by the hand. But then the text goes on to say Jesus touched him a second time. Now, this touch, the Bible says Jesus... I, want y'all to, I don't want y'all to try to make this you know, nicer than it was. Your Bible says that Jesus took him by the hand, led him out of the city, and spat on him. And the man was blind. So that means he didn't spit on his feet. Jesus spit in the man's face. Now, let me just say something to you. This furthers my thesis on the robust nature and personality of Jesus. Because if Jesus had been some frail, effeminate, sissified man, blind or not, you spit in my face, we got to throw down. But maybe it was that Jesus was too beefy for this man to even come against him. That's a hermeneutical hypothesis. It's not in the text at all. Don't be looking for it. But the first touch was a guiding touch. The first touch was a converting touch. But the second touch was an uncomfortable touch. Everybody wants a guiding, loving, converting touch. But may I suggest to you anniversaries, when things come around, every anniversary hasn't been comfortable. Some years, you're plagued with discomfort when you're buying property or fixing things or having major expenditures, or, or just had a mass exodus and you got to celebrate anyway. Yeah. Or just went through a scandal and you got to celebrate anyway. Yeah. The Bible says Jesus spat in the man's face. Yeah. It was If I could sleep at night and not do this, I would go on and not do this. But because he has put his hand on me, it's an uncomfortable touch. Jesus spat in the man's face. I don't want you to clean it up and make it on the... No, 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 no. (laughs) 
he spat in the brother's face, laid his hands on him. And a curious thing happened. Watch this, y'all, because I'm about to wax a little theological in these last eight or nine minutes that I have. Listen, listen. The, 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 the text says Jesus spat on him, laid his hands on him, released him, and then said, now what do you see? Watch this. The man then said, I see men walking like trees. Now, here's where I'm going to press against some of y'all's theology. Because Jesus has taken him by the hand and has touched him. And he still ain't healed. Jesus, who has sent his word and healed Jairus' daughter. Jesus, who touched the coffin, didn't even touch the boy, of the widow woman of Nain, and her son rises up. Jesus, who stood outside of the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he raised up from the dead. But he has now taken him by the hand, spat on him, and laid his hands on him, and this man is Still blind. And now you have to ask yourself the theological inquiry as to whether or not he has the power that we say he has. Because if he had the power we said he has, he would have healed him on first mention. I mean, we, it's, good, it's a good preaching point. We stand up and preach about Lazarus, and we say he had to call him by name because if he'd have just said, come forth, everybody dead in that tomb would have got up out the grave because he's got that much power, so much power. Oh, power. We end every sermon on Easter Sunday. He got up with all power in his hand. You know. But can I suggest to you today that he took him by the hand, and he wasn't healed. He spat on him. He didn't get healed. He laid hands on him, and he still wasn't healed. Could it be that we are now having to deal with a side of healing that the church doesn't want to deal with? That sometimes your healing will come instantly, but at other times, and probably most of the time, you're going to have to go through the process. And maybe some of us are frustrated this morning because we've got a first touch and a second touch. We've been following while we're blind. We've suffered the indignity of the uncomfortable touch and yet we are not healed. Can I suggest to you today that some of your healing is going to come through your persistence? This is a dimension of Jesus' character that we don't oftentimes talk about. Jesus is the same one that taught the parable of the unjust judge who the widow woman kept on coming to and saying, you got to vindicate my child. You got to vindicate my child. And it wasn't because he feared God. It wasn't because he loved the woman. It wasn't because he was interested in justice. It was because she was persistent. Slap somebody a high five and say, be persistent. We have taught y'all in the contemporary church that if you just come to the altar once, it's going to happen. We've taught you in the contemporary church, just let me lay my hands on you one time. Your whole life will change. We've taught you in the contemporary church, if you throw your wallet up over your left shoulder and spin around three times before it hits the ground, you're going to never be broke again. But I'd like to suggest to you today, some things only come through persistence. Some things you just got to stick with it. Some of y'all haven't said nothing to nobody, but grab a neighbor's hand like you're going to pull it out of socket and say neighbor stick with it God's about to bless your life but you got to stick with it God's about to change your circumstances but you got to stick with it it's uncomfortable right now and you've suffered indignity but you got to stick with it he just spat in your face he just made you a mockery and an open shame but if you stick with it he will turn your life around find another neighbor somebody you haven't spoken to all morning and tell them say neighbor y'all ain't said nothing to nobody tell them say neighbor oh neighbor I believe 
believe if you stick with it in this season God will turn your life around say it like I said it say God will turn your life around hey do you believe that today is there anybody here besides me that has had to hold on going through hell and high water said I tell somebody stick with it is there anybody here besides me who's had to press your way even though you had trouble on every side find somebody else and tell them stick with it stick with it stick with it weeping may endure for a night but joy come in the morning say yeah say yeah say yeah somebody give him praise and glory right now listen Jesus spat on him it was an uncomfortable touch see Prior to the discomfort, the man couldn't see anything. But after he went through an uncomfortable situation, he couldn't see things totally, but he could see things differently. Could it be that sometimes discomfort is not designed to clear it up totally? But it is designed for you and I to begin to entertain the possibility that there is another way of seeing this. I'm always concerned about people who are so myopic in their vision that they never consider that there may be another way. I'm about to mess up the whole sermon right here. Um, Y'all, part of the challenge of the Christian church contemporarily, and Dave Kinnaman and, and, um, and Gabe Lyons and then wrote, wrote the book Unchurched, and it talked about why millennials, younger, this younger generation, are exiting the church. Let me tell you why. One of the things that they contested, it, it has st- stood out so strongly in my heart, is the church's inability to see things another way. See, when you start talking like this, people start thinking that you're risky. They start questioning whether or not you're orthodox in your theological proposition. No, I'm orthodox. I'm just not dogmatic. Because I've lived long enough. I'm 52 years old. I've lived over half a century. I've been in church all my life. I've been preaching since I was 12. I got 40 years in the ministry. I'm not no novice. I just wake up yesterday and build a church. I've been doing this a long time. I've been pastoring 27 years. I've been a bishop in the Lord's church for 13 years. I, this ain't nothing, nothing, nothing new to me. I'm, I'm just not getting started. I've been observing some things, and some stuff that we've been praying for ain't changing. Maybe we ought to see it a different way. Maybe, maybe, instead of looking at that young lady who has had all them babies out of wedlock, Instead of calling her loose and promiscuous, maybe we ought to see it a different way. Maybe that man strung out on drugs, and, and, and you know he, he like you got to make the choice. You got to make the choice. Make, make, if you ain't never been hooked on nothing, don't talk to me. See, that's that's why your neighbor won't say amen because they don't want you to know that they've had something that got a hold of them and wouldn't let them go. Some of y'all, don't you leave me out here by myself. How many of y'all in here besides me have ever had the bad case of the can't help it? I would do differently, but I can't help it. I would change, but I can't. Some of us know the frustration of coming to the altar and saying, God, you're the only one that can fix this. If you don't change me, I will not change. But the church has stood over people and instead of instead of feeding them, we ask them why they got in this condition. Everybody Jesus ever healed, he never asked them, well, how in the world did you get where you are today? Jesus just said stuff like, do you want to be made whole? 
and the uncomfortable touch. Sometimes God has to send us through seasons of discomfort to get us to identify with people who are going through challenges of life that we would not readily identify with if we ourselves had not been discomforted. This is why I don't tell people, women in the Me Too movement, how they ought to feel. Because I ain't never been a woman. I ain't never had a man. I, and I mean, I'm a part of the movement in that I had, I had a boss when I was a, a public school teacher. I had a boss, one who was responsible for my, my, my supervision, one who was responsible for evaluations, one who was responsible. She came on to me. She wanted to, to, to have, I was single with cheek of tan and, 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 I mean, she did. I was, I, I had, at that time, I had a six pack. It has since graduated to a two liter, but I mean, at that time. It was a six pack. The point that I'm making is, is that I know what it's like to have to have the kind of sexual pressure put on you. I know what it's like, and I didn't capitulate. And it ain't because I was holy. She just wasn't my type. Y'all trying to act like y'all all spiritual and holy. I don't know how in the world they ever did that. You ain't did it because it wasn't your type. You didn't do it because ain't nobody offered it to you. You didn't. I don't know how you would. They got caught up like that. I know how. But I, I've tried to make it my own personal practice in ministry and, and, and in life and an attitude and, and disposition not to try to tell women how they ought to feel because I've not been discomforted in that way. Never been a woman. I don't know what it's like to know that my job is on the line if I don't sleep with a joker or, 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 or be okay with his advances or, or smile and grin when on the inside I'm repulsed. I think it's important that we recognize that a, an uncomfortable touch is the touch that causes us to identify with other people's pain even though we ourselves are not totally healed. He was blind and Jesus was spitting on him. He was getting him ready to be healed because you're not ready to be healed until you have been made uncomfortable. The text says that then Jesus laid his hands on him again, play unto me softly, I'm done. The text says that his first touch, he took him by the hand. Second touch, he spat on him. First touch was a converting touch, a guiding touch. Second touch was a discomforting touch. The third touch was a clarifying touch. The Bible says, after he looked at him and said, what do you see? I see men is walking, men is trees walking. Jesus said, well, that ain't right. Let's try this again. And it's not because Jesus tried the first time and failed. Jesus knew what he was doing. He was, it was a process. Send a man through. Can I suggest to you, Bishop, these 23 years have been a part of your process. Some of the ups and downs, some of the swelling and some of the diminution, some of the people that have said, I love you and I'm with you forever, and then two weeks later they're offended at another church. Some of the brethren in the city who liked you as a pastor but will despise you as a bishop. It's a part of your process. Can I suggest to you, friends, that some of the people that walked with you while you were broke but left you the minute you got independent of them? Can I suggest to you that the relationship that you went through, however sordid it was, that you thought you couldn't live without but you had to live without because they left you, Maybe we could reframe all of that in not the devil was winning, getting the victory, and God forsook me. No, no, no. Maybe he was spitting in your face, making you uncomfortable as a part of your process. Now, when you see them little girls about to hook up with the wrong kind of guy, you can pull it to the side and say, baby, let me show you this knife wound right here. When that joker who told me who he loved me stabbed me.
because I've been through some things in my process that have clarified my vision. Jesus lays his hands on him a third time. Each of us spends seasons of our lives seeing people like the blind man the wrong way. The text says, what do you see? I see men as trees walk. That's the wrong way. He had a, a jaundiced eye. His view was skewed. His, he didn't see things the right way. And notice, notice, I said it the wrong way. He didn't see people the right way. I see men as trees walk. His view of people was skewed. And see here, friends, the key to success in life is the management of relationships. If you can't see people right, you can't manage the relationship right. Thus, you will not succeed in life. The whole of God's story in the planet is Jesus coming down to have relationship with us. And they, the ones who rejected him didn't see him. He came unto his own. But his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You see, friends, when you see your bishop wrong, you'll believe your co-workers when they say all he wants is your money. The reason that they say that they're not bad people, they just see men as trees. They need a clarifying touch. And you and I, who have walked with him long enough and have encountered him on the side of the road enough times, have had enough engagements, have, have had enough indignities, have had enough touches to be able to have clear vision. To be able to say, no, 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 it's not that. My vision has been clarified. How? Because I've had several touches. This is why we encourage you to come to church. This is why we tell you to bring the young people to church. This is why we tell you to lift your hands and be involved, invested in the worship. Why? Because we know that every time he touches you, it gets clearer and clearer and clearer. Some of you will understand why you had to go through what you went through over the last 23 years as he touches you over and over and over again. He makes it clearer and clearer. It's a clarifying touch. You'll stop despising the way he brought you and start saying, you know what? We will understand it better by and by. It's a clarifying touch. God did not abandon or forsake you. You were just going through a season of uncomfortable touches. I know it was hard. I know it was difficult. It, it, in, in, in all human reality, some of it shouldn't have happened shouldn't have happened. You're, you're the, the victim of a fallen system in a fallen world. He, he shouldn't have touched you like that. I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about that man. She shouldn't have messed over you like that. They shouldn't have fired you without cause. They shouldn't have arrested you for, for that little offense. They, you, they, you shouldn't have a record right now. You're living in a fallen society. and I know, I know we blame God to, to made this and God caused this and God allowed this. But can I suggest to you today, maybe we could reframe that as my vision's being clarified. I no longer see men as trees. I'm beginning to see men as they are. The goal in a 23rd anniversary is to not behave like we lived in our 22nd anniversary. In marriage counseling, I, I, marriage counseling, Tony and I do marriage counseling. People are so frustrated they come to marriage counseling and it's, I like our marriage ought to be better than this. We've been married for 25 years. And they start telling us this story and all this stuff. And then I, at some point, I just interrupt them and say, you know what? Y'all ain't been married 25 years. Yes, we have. We got married in 1993. No, no, no. Y'all haven't been married 25 years. Y'all been married one year. Y'all just repeated it 25 times. The goal in year 23 is not to be at the same place that you were in year 22. The goal going forward, y'all, is to receive the kind of touch, whether it's a guiding touch, a converting touch, a discomforting touch, 
or a clarifying touch. So that way, next year and the next year and the next, when we come back to this moment, your vision is more clear than it's ever been before. You know, don't, 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 I don't want don't, don't to embarrass nobody. I don't want to put nobody out there. But how many of you know, if I saw things five years ago the way I see them right now, my life would be different. If I knew then what I... <laughs> People always say, I got a 21-year-old son, and when I see, see Caleb and these other young cats running around here, I, 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 the people, so every now and then, you know, my hair's gray, and I'm getting older, and that kind of stuff. You know, I still got it where it counts, but I'm just saying. Uh, but they be like, would you go back? Would you go back? Yeah, 21-year-old son, would you go back to that age? Yeah, if I could take my sense. If I could take 52-year-old sense back into a 21-year-old body, who wouldn't? Sure I would. Youth is a wonderful time of life. It's a shame it's wasted on the young. But see, in my 52 years, I've had enough touches to clarify my vision so I could see people more clearly today than I have before. They weren't against you. They were hurt. Your daddy did love you. He just, only thing he knew to do was what was done to him being raised. He didn't know no better. He, you, you do better when you know better. Your parents, some of y'all young ladies, you get a clarifying touch. Your parents told you don't go have no babies. But when that baby comes, that clarifies it for you, doesn't it? Oh, this is why you didn't want me to have no money. Because now I don't have a social life, and now I don't have no money, and now I'm up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. It's a clarifying touch. I want to suggest to you today that Jesus, whenever we come into the house of God, he's here to clarify our vision, to see things circumspectly and more clearly than we've ever seen them before.